Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. My Bigfoot encounters started happening when I was nine years old. I saw one outside my window at night, and I'll never forget it. Its huge eyes, gigantic yellow crusted teeth, and that awkward smile, as if someone who had never smiled before was trying to smile at me. I recall pulling the covers up over my head in fear and then lying there, submerged in that fear until I finally fell asleep. Fast forward to high school, and I'm an all-state defensive starter being recruited by the University of Texas, Auburn University, and Florida State University. We had just played our crosstown rival and lost by a field goal. In the final seconds, I'm angry, overwhelmed, and worried because there were scouts at that game. And although I performed well, three sacks and 13 tackles, it was the missed tackle that led to the field goal. I remember pulling up to my parents' house and just sitting there. It's 11 p.m. I'm too tired to get out of the truck, my legs hurt, and my mind keeps replaying that missed tackle. I'm stuck in that middle stair when I notice movement out of the corner of my eye. I look over, and there's that darn Bigfoot in the passenger side window, smiling at me. To be clear, the window is rolled down. His face is where the window should be and it takes up the entire opening where the window was rolled down. Next thing I know, the truck is shaking like I'm in an earthquake, rocking back and forth, and it rolls its head in this long, exaggerated movement, and I can tell that it's repositioning itself to reach through that window. But it happened so fast, the next thing I know, its hand is coming through the open window and it's growling. The sound echoing around in the cab of my truck was deafening, and all I could do was think about getting out of the truck. So now I'm swinging the driver's side door open and stepping out when it pulls the truck. To be clear, it drew the truck towards it as if it were a freaking toy, causing me to do a freaking split struggling to get my right leg out of the truck. I'm not sure if he heard what was going on or was waiting for me to get home to talk to him, but all I remember is his boots. Seeing my dad's boots walking toward me as I was in that split position, and then hearing his shotgun. Six shots, and what sounded like a bunch of chimps going crazy off in the woods. Then he helped me up, and got me to the front door of the house before turning around and going back out into the darkness with that shotgun. 
For the next 20 minutes, I heard him shooting. Then it was quiet, and Dad came back home with blood all over his clothes and shoes. I remember asking him what had happened and what it was, but he just looked me in the eyes and walked away. He never spoke a word about it. Years later, my mother and I are talking, and she opens up about how that night changed my father. Listen, I know he was in the Navy and had been to war. Heck, my mother and I were alone a lot. What I didn't know was how many lives he had taken. Mom said he knew about that creature, had tracked it, and even knew where its nest was. He could have killed it years ago, but he didn't want to take any more lives. That night, he took its life to protect me. On to the next one. I spent most of my life not believing in ghosts. The idea of hauntings had always seemed like an invention of the imagination. But then, I had an experience that crushed my skepticism and left me feeling like I didn't know anything. One evening in my apartment building in Kew Gardens, New York, I had just returned home from a long day at work and was looking forward to a relaxing night. Little did I know that the solitude I thought would turn into a heart-pounding encounter. I sensed a subtle shift in the atmosphere as I entered the dimly lit stairwell. There was an apparent tension, but I tried to brush it aside. An ease continued creeping up my spine, and I quickened my pace, eager to reach the safety of my unit. It was in the third floor hallway that I first caught sight of it, an apparition. The ghostly figure was that of an amputee, its leg ending above its knee. Misery seemed to project from its form, making me feel awful the moment I saw it. I would say that feeling was more present than fear, strangely. The ghost turned its head towards me, its empty gaze locked onto me. I could feel its longing, its yearning for something beyond my understanding. And then, without warning, it began to move, slowly at first, but with an increasing sense of urgency. Fear propelled me into action. I stumbled backward, my heart pounding, and I rushed down the stairs. Each step was a desperate attempt to escape the figure that pursued me. But no matter how fast I ran, it remained just a few steps behind me. The stairwell felt like an endless maze, although a reasonable distance behind. I felt convinced that I could feel something brush against my back at various moments. My mind was so desperate for an explanation while simultaneously fighting for survival. Was this a spirit with unfinished business? Had it once been a residence of the complex? Using every ounce of strength, I burst through the stairwell and into the safety of the ground floor hallway. The specter faded, as if unable to proceed. I collapsed against the wall, keeping an eye out for any reappearing danger. Silence enveloped the area, broken only by my raspy breath. My mind whirled, struggling to make sense of everything I had just endured. The next day, I had difficulty dismissing the encounter from my thoughts. The experience had clung to me, even though the spirit was nowhere in sight. I became consumed with a desire to understand, to get to the bottom of the mystery, of the amputee ghost. Unfortunately, I was never able to, which took me a while to surrender to. Before we continue, let me ask you, what do you guys like to do while listening to these stories? The way that they're set up, it's kind of perfect to kind of do other stuff while you're listening along. So what do you like to do while listening to these scary stories? Are you doing a Sudoku puzzle? Are you knitting? Let me know in the comments down below. On to the next one. In Morris County in New Jersey, 
It was a warm May evening. Three high school friends and myself went up to Split Rock Reservoir one Friday night to hang out. We pulled off to a small parking area just south of the reservoir dam. We all got out of the car, and as we were sitting around the car just talking, we all heard a loud sound like a howl. Then we heard some large noises, like something was shaking or moving branches. We all looked at each other and jumped back in the car as quickly as we possibly could and drove off. Until recently, I hadn't given this incident much thought, but after reading some Bigfoot encounters online from the area of New Jersey, I have become aware that this could have been a similar creature described in one of these other documented accounts. The witnesses were four high school friends between 17 to 18 years old sitting on the hood of a car, just talking and laughing. It was between 8 and 9 p.m. in a heavily wooded forest area. Split Rock Reservoir is a state-protected watershed area. Split Rock Reservoir is located in the northwest corner of Morris County, New Jersey. It is very close to Sussex County, where I have read about other Sasquatch accounts. The reservoir is, to this day, a very large area that is desolate, protected by the state, and underdeveloped. On to the next one. I had an experience many years ago in Jackson, New Jersey. I was a teenager then. My younger brother and I and three friends set out to steal some wood from a house that was being built to build on our fort. We really didn't think anything wrong of it at the time. We were all pretty young. It was about 8 p.m. when we set out. We would have to walk back through our friend's property to get to the house. About three acres of property past some old chicken coops and down a narrow path with thick vegetation and trees. I was in the lead position and everyone else following single file through the woods. All I had was a small disposable flashlight. It only covered about a 10-foot distance. We figured one flashlight so there would be less chance of being spotted. As we went past the chicken coop, we heard a sound ahead of us in the darkness, but figured it to be our friend's dog, thinking it had followed us. We kept going. I was still in the lead with the flashlight. It was just pitch dark around us, surrounded by trees and bushes. We could no longer see any house light from our friend's house. I would shine the light behind me every now and then to make sure my brother was okay and everyone was keeping up. Then I got butterflies in my stomach. I felt like someone was watching us. I was telling my friend to be quiet so I could listen for anyone. I shined the flashlight around, but couldn't see anything. Then I heard a noise in front of us. I spun around, and all I could see was a very large figure. Whatever it was, its eyes reflected red. It looked like a silhouette in the darkness with my small light. I tried to talk to it, saying, how's it going, but got no response. Then the figure moved closer, and I got scared and yelled to my friends to run, but they began to pick up anything they could to throw it at the figure. Once that happened, I heard a deep, low growl and began to run right past my brother and friends. Then they followed in suit. When I got to the chicken coop, I plowed through the door and my friend's brother followed me in. We were scared as heck. We didn't move for possibly an hour. We just sat there listening for the thing. When we got brave enough, we ran all the way back to our friend's house, telling his mom and dad what had happened, but they did not believe us. We then decided to be brave again and go back out to look for the thing with baseball bat. We did a lot of talking, but never went back. I think we were just trying to save face with each other. I know what I saw wasn't a man. It was just too big, and the eyes were red, like a dark red. And I've never heard of any bears in Jackson, New Jersey, and I've lived there for at least 13 years. So I don't know what it was, but I'm positive it wasn't a man. My brother and I never went back to that location after what happened. Besides myself, there were four other people. We were getting ready to steal wood. 
getting dressed and such. It was 8 p.m. It was a pretty warm night, but overcast. It was a pine forest, not far from a swampy area and an old dog kennel where it was later discovered the owners of the kennel kept their adopted kid in the kennel. That happened some years later. On to the next one. Fred Renato, 34, was camping in the woods at Lawrenceburg, New Jersey. He had lit a fire, his truck was parked right beside him, and he was laying there in his sleeping bag on a sort of knob in the terrain. He woke at 3.30 in the morning hearing cries from a nearby wooded area. He sat, bolt upright, and then heard this thing crashing through the undergrowth. It was making loud, thudding noises, and he could hear its feet hitting the ground. Eventually, a white shape came out of the darkness, walking at a good pace. It was breathing heavily, like it had asthma. He described them as big noises. The figure was 50 to 75 yards away and seemed to be the size of a plywood sheet around 9 feet tall. Then it saw Fred and hopped up a few times. He saw that it was big, white, and furry when it hopped. Fred hopped into his truck and watched it fade away into the distance. The next morning, 15-inch footprints were found where it had been. On to the next one. In Warren County in New Jersey, it was forested wetland at the base of a ridge on the southeast side and agricultural field on the west. Whatever it was, it crossed west to east on Ridge Road. I was coming home after work at about 9.30 to 10 p.m., heading north on Ridge Road. It recently rained. Something ran across the road on two legs. It was about 50 to 100 yards away. It appeared to be about as tall as the hood of my car. It stopped momentarily as my headlight hit it and looked at my car. Then... It turned and continued to cross the road and disappeared into the wood. I was thinking, what the hell was that? I live nearby and hunt throughout the surrounding woods. I know it wasn't a bear or anything we normally see in the area. It crossed the road at the same place where a deer trail crosses the road. It was the night after a rainstorm. The area is a creek valley above the Delaware Valley. On to the next one. This occurred at Batana Trail, Wharton State Forest, Burlington County, New Jersey. Myself and three friends were hiking down the Batana Trail through the New Jersey Pine Barren when we stopped at a trailside campsite for the night. This was around 8.30 to 9 p.m. At about 11 to midnight, we heard an odd high-pitched scream like a cross between a howl and a whistle. A few minutes later, we could hear a large animal moving through the brush, making that scream as it went. It appeared to stop every few minutes before it would continue on its way. It was about 20 yards off into the woods, which are very thick at this point. There were no open fires permitted and very dim moonlight, so no one could see what was making the noise. The animal moved along his way and the sound faded. No one really wanted to go out and look since we only had one flashlight. I've hunted and fished that area often and so have my friends, but none of us have ever heard sounds like that before or since. We should have checked the area the next day, but we did not. The total time we heard the animal was about 10 minutes. It seemed to stay about 20 to 25 yards away as it moved past our campsite. The next day, some other hikers we met, coming from the other way, also claimed they heard the same thing. It seemed to be making its way through the woods. On to the next one. In 2013, my family decided to move to the mountains of West Virginia, about four miles from Plum Orchard Lake. We found our perfect little cabin nestled in the mountains on 10 acres with a small creek that ran through the property. Behind our property were thousands of acres of state-owned land 
that were full of rugged beauty. The first few weeks went by without any incident, and we greatly enjoyed our new life. In that area of the United States, seasons changed faster than in our home state of Georgia. We noticed more and more wildlife getting closer to our house and around the creek. One of my friends came up to visit us, and he fell in love with the property. He enjoyed it so much that we ended up letting him put a tiny house at the bottom of the property in a clearing with a great view of the creek about 50 yards from the main house. He ended up coming to work for me, and we rode there together every morning. About a month after he moved to the property, we came home late one evening, pulled into the driveway, and got out, only to hear the strangest noise coming from the ridge above the house. It sounded like something was pacing the ridge and making a loud, blowing noise. We sat and listened for a few minutes. I thought it was strange, but we parted ways and went about our separate evening routines. The next morning, I picked up my friend like usual, but he seemed shaken and extremely exhausted. I asked what was the matter, and he said that tree limbs and stones kept hitting the side of his small house throughout the night. He seemed sincerely horrified. A few days went by, and my wife said she had this uneasy feeling while being outside, almost like she was being washed by something. She also said something was knocking things over in the yard. I began to suspect that maybe a bear was meddling around since the area has such a high population of them. That year, we started getting our first snowfall around Halloween, something we were not prepared for being from the south. We spent a lot of the evening after that chopping logs on the very back of the property for firewood. While back there, we noticed what we thought were game trails down behind the house, which you could follow all the way to the creek. We thought nothing of it and continued collecting wood. That night, we started hearing something hitting our house. At first, it sounded like small stones, but then transitioned into what sounded like much larger rock. I called my friend to see if he was messing around, but down the receiver, I could hear the same noise of stones hitting the top of his house as well. We decided to see what was going on and to meet one another on my porch. I had my rifle and he had his. Both of our pits were with us. We grabbed our flashlight and headed towards the ridge. The dogs seemed extremely anxious. They were acting like something was close, but we couldn't see anything. All we found was a horrible odor and some disturbed stones around the house. Thanksgiving came and went, and Christmas was fast approaching. All the strange activity seemed to die down for a few weeks. That is, until my friend got into my work van one morning and seemed completely freaked out. He said he had spent the entire night with his gun in his lap and his dog growling and watching his front door. He asked if I had heard anything the night before, and I explained that I slept like a baby. He went on to stress that something was messing with his front door, and he was honestly scared to death. That weekend was like any other. We spent much of the time watching movies before heading to bed around 10.30. Suddenly, we were awoken at 2 in the morning by an alarming sound. Boom, boom, boom. It sounded like something was hitting the side of the house with a two-by-four. My kid and wife were crying, and they all fled into our bedroom. I called my friend, and he said he could hear the sound from his place. I could hear his dog snarling in the background. We decided to get the guns and head outside to see what was going on. He ran up to my house, and we set off into the woods. My dog was growling toward the tree line, so we headed in that direction. As we got closer, the dogs seemed afraid of something. We kept yelling out, Who's there? The dogs then started barking loudly toward the trees next to us, and we shined our light in that direction. That's when we saw it. I'm over six foot two, and this had to be at least eight foot eight or taller. Its hair was dark 
and matted, and when my light hit its eyes, they shined red. It was only there for a second, but time froze, and I absorbed every detail of the moment. It then stepped back into the thicket of wood behind it. The world became alive again, and fear set in. My friend was screaming, Did you see that? Did you effing see that? What the F was that? I said, I don't know, man. And the urge to flee from the area quickly set in. We ran back down the property, and something yelled out toward us. A roar unlike anything I had ever heard before. There was also the sound of pacing in the ridge. We both went into my house, locked the doors, and sat with my family till morning. The next day, my friend decided to move, and my family and I left in the spring, never to look back. On to the next one. This terrifying and confusing experience happened on a typical summer night at my grandmother's house in Winston, Georgia. So, at around 11 p.m. Eastern Time, me and some of my buddies were hanging around outside. To give you a better visual of where the sighting took place, it's important to know that my grandmother's house is surrounded by trees on all sides except for in the driveway. On the left inside, the driveway at the bottom of the hill, there is a ditch that we put cut up branches and tree leaves in. During this frightening encounter, we were standing at the top of the hill between the house and the van. We were chilling outside next to the van for at least an hour and a half, and during that whole time, I never saw or heard anything go into the ditch. Then, all of a sudden, a big, somewhat human, bear-like creature crawled out of the ditch and stood up on two legs. It bolted down and out of the driveway and headed toward the left side of the road. Startled, I repeatedly yelled, Hey, who is that? What are you doing here? The creature didn't even turn its head or anything. If I had to describe the creature, I would say it was over seven feet tall and very bulky. From where I stood, it looked as though it had thick, woolly, black hair or fur. Its neck and shoulders were not at a right angle like a person's, but rather it was almost rounded where the neck and shoulders touched. I started to chase after it as I really wanted to solve the mystery, but then my gut forced me to stop because I had no clue what I was getting myself into. When it ran to the left, I imagined that it probably ran through the woods to the train track I haven't seen it again since then. Ever since, I prefer not to walk alone in that neighborhood at night. I even bought a trail camera, and I will be sure to let you know if it ever comes back. But I really hope it doesn't. On to the next one. In central Washington state, my mom and I had gone camping for the weekend and Saturday morning. She claimed she heard the most terrible screaming sound the night before that lasted a few hours. I'm a heavy sleeper, so I told her wake me up if the sound continued that night as well. Around four in the morning, she woke me up and told me to listen. It wasn't long before I heard the screaming that sounded like nothing either of us had heard before. It was also very, very loud. We left the tent and everyone around us in all the other campsites were awake too. The sound was exactly what I heard of a Bigfoot recording online. A chill still runs down my spine when I hear it. There were also gunshots with the screaming. The only other witnesses I was in contact with was my mother, although there were many other people in the campsite. It was dark. The night was clear and cool. It was thick pine forest surrounded by mountain ridges. On to the next one. This was near Cougar in Skamania County in Washington. My family and I were visiting a cousin, a minister at a large church in Vancouver, Washington, and his family. We went out to do some fishing and scouting for the upcoming elk season. Eventually, we stopped at a large meadow to look for sign. 
As I was cutting back and forth through the meadow, I spotted scat I did not recognize. Nearby, perhaps thirty feet away, I spotted another scat of the same type. As I looked at the second, I spotted a third, located fairly close to the second. All the scat appeared to be fresh. The scat were large, about five inches or so in diameter, but not the form or color of any large mammal scat that I knew. They seemed to be composed of finely ground plat material. As I examined the third scat, I suddenly realized what appeared to be a large, human-like footprint was next to the third scat. I yelled for my cousin. He never did hear me, but I finally saw him and waved him over. When he arrived, I pointed to the third scat without saying a word. Before he even came to a stop, he said, I don't know what it is. Then I pointed to the footprint, again without saying anything. He pressed his lips tightly together as he examined it, then simply looked at me and nodded. J, my son, and one of my cousin's sons, B, both thirteen, were playing back near the vehicle. When they saw the footprint, they instantly accused us of trying to play a trick on them. Their joking assessment of the scat was that it was from B's older brother. It did look somewhat human-like. We were pressed for time the afternoon was supposed to be spent in Portland, doing some shopping and sightseeing. With our wives and kids, I took a couple of pictures and collected the scat. We put them in the freezer when we arrived back at my cousin's house. The pictures were developed that night, but they did not turn out very well. Track details in particular were washed out. The track was two of my cousin's hand bands in length, about 16 inches. Upon arriving back home in Oklahoma City on Saturday, I began to search the internet for Sasquatch-related sites. I contacted the BFRO. We did get a lot of follow-up from the researchers. I was in contact with several researchers by email, but my cousin was contacted personally by phone. As I understand things, the scat were shown to wildlife faculty, but no guess as to their identity was ventured. The last word we had on our observation was that they were from an area of high interest to the BFRO, and that there were plans to study the area more intensely in the future. The only other odd thing I can add is that just before we arrived at the meadow, we saw a bear. Not that seeing a bear is so unusual, but this bear was running like it had been shot out of a cannon. It ran across the road from east to west. The witnesses were two adults ages 46 and 42, and two adolescents, each 13 years old. The environment is one of thick pine forest interspersed with clear cut in various stages of succession. We parked near Burrow Pit. Several stories have been told to my cousin by some of the older men from the church where he pastors. These are Christian men who have hunted in this area for many years. All I remember is something to the effect that there were some encounters which left them so shaken that they refused to return to certain areas. On to the next one. In Snohomish County in Washington, I and my friend were riding horses in the hills near my house on Trout Farm Road. Well, we have to go on this hill to get to Sultan Basin Road. We were going through the woods and I felt that something was watching us. I turned and looked in the woods beside the path, and I saw a large man-like figure deep in the woods. I told my girlfriend to pick up a little speed that I was not feeling too good. So we got the horses into a trot, and I told her to go a little faster, so we did. I did not want to tell her what I saw, because I knew she would freak out. I still have not told her about it. I told my husband. He and my friend's husband went to the hills where we were riding. They did not find anything, but my husband said that he felt like something was watching them too. I don't know if it was someone or maybe a bear, but I know that I don't go riding up those hills by myself. We were riding horses. I saw something she did not. Deep wooded area near power lines up in the hill. On to the next one. Some Bigfoot Believers both modern and ancient, have offered a rather idealistic view of the creatures as guardians of the forest, a somewhat ironic title for entities that inflict so much damage to trees, both assumed and witnessed. Multiple witnesses have reported 
Bigfoot creatures snapping or twisting trees and limbs, presumably in anger or as a show of strength, as they walk through the forest. Of course, there are also the powerful wood knocks, presumed to be Bigfoot, smashing limbs, rocks, or something against trees. Last but not least, there are the enigmatic tree structures, which tend to show up in areas where Bigfoot activity has also been reported. Because of their alleged affinity for breaking, bending, and knocking trees, Bigfoot Arboreal Association is a foregone conclusion. Our wild men, whatever forms they have taken, have always lived in the dappled shadows of the forest. At some point in our evolution, man chose savanna over trees, building villages in clearings, cutting down trees to make open spaces. Were we trying to escape the others that dwell within the deep dark wood, or did the other move beyond the tree line when man chose the field? Whatever the reason, the forest became a place of mystery and danger. Within forests dwell beside lions and tigers and bears, oh my, Bigfoot. Medieval depictions of wild men blend with the forest itself. Artistic representations of the green man and some wood woes, illustrations appear wholly comprised of branches and leaves. In modern times, Bigfoot are commonly reported with sticks, leaves, and moss in their hair. This detail strongly reflects indigenous Native American traditions, such as the Cherokee Stone Coat or the Senka Stone Giant, legendary cannibal giants with impenetrable skin. Some researchers equate these creatures with Bigfoot suggesting the creatures roll in mud or mud and gravel, which only gives the appearance of stone skin. Bigfoot researcher Bob Garnett gathered similar testimony suggesting Bigfoot used mud to attach leaves to their hair for camouflage. A similar theory proposed by Daniel Dover, author of Evidence Sasquatch Camouflage Themselves, suggests the scaly bipedal South Carolina lizard man which allegedly harassed the Bishopville Swamp circa 1988, may have, in fact, been a Bigfoot with dried mud, algae, and other detritus caked into its hair. Dover asserts dried and cracked mud could impart the appearance of scale. The Honey Island Swamp Monster, a large, hairy hominid from the bayous of Louisiana, is sometimes reported with weed entangled in it, or possibly an algae bloom on its hair sometimes commonly seen in the coats of cloth. Other encounters describe Bigfoot mimicking trees, stumps, rocks, and logs. For example, Brian Duke Sullivan, a Bigfoot investigator and podcast host from Montana, told a 2015 incident in which he saw a Bigfoot pretending to be a stump. Sullivan noticed what he thought was a stump with a peculiar face-like pattern on it. He reached for his video camera intending to document the stump as an example of pareidolia when he noticed the face's expression had changed. At this time, he realized the stump was actually a Bigfoot creature, which appeared rather upset at the prospect of being filmed. Sullivan decided to move along rather than deal with an angry stump squatch. Similarly, a witness in Benzie County, Michigan, in the mid-1980s, reported seeing a large boulder in a field which, after a time, proceeded to stand up. It had the shape of a person, but the witness said it looked to be two feet taller than the average man, with arms hanging down to its knees. Kevin Jones, a 16-year-old hunter in the Blue Mountains of Washington, observed a Bigfoot creature for 45 minutes through his rifle scope. At some point, two other hunters walked by the creature, which turned, curled its body, and took on the appearance of a stump. The hikers walked within 15 feet of the creature and seemed to look directly at it. Jones noted that the hunters seemed startled at first, but quickly seemed to lose interest and simply walked away. The color most associated with the forest is perhaps green. Green Bigfoot are more common than the traditional cryptozoologists would have us believe. Here are some reports of green Bigfoot. Toad Road in York County, Pennsylvania, is an area fraught with strangeness. In addition to reports of winged entities, ghosts, and mysterious lights, witnesses have also reported Bigfoot. 
In 1973, a green-haired monster attacked witnesses in the area. Jeff Bedouin was camped atop a mountain in Maine with his cousin. After the two heard several tree breaks, Jeff's cousin witnessed a Bigfoot with a green face looking at them from above a ten-foot through tree. The rest of the night, the two men experienced several hallmark Bigfoot encounters, including some stranger aspects, such as the sound of a woman singing and an ATV, neither of which were noticeably present. Fluorescent Freddy was a ten-foot-tall monster seen in the region of French Lick, Indiana, in March of 1965. While some cryptozoologists report that Freddy gained the title fluorescent due to his glowing red eyes, they usually omit the strange fact that the same witnesses stated Freddy was covered with emerald green fur. Millwraith Park, Indiana residents reported multiple encounters with a green-haired monster in November of 1974. In one incident, a resident heard strange noises before discovering the monster in a garage. He locked the creature inside, but when police were called, nothing was found. Some Bigfoot aficionados, admittedly those who tend to dwell on the opposite side of the spectrum from the flesh-and-blood hypothesis folk, have even suggested that Bigfoot somehow live inside trees, or use trees as some sort of means to enter our reality. In an episode of his television series, Survivor Man Bigfoot, survivalist, musician, and filmmaker Les Stroud visited northwestern California in search of answers to the Bigfoot mystery. Deep in the forest, accompanied by a Hoopa guide named Inker, Stroud found his electronic equipment and cameras malfunctioning in strange ways. They heard wood knock, then, sitting by a large cedar, noticed knock that seemed to issue from inside the tree. Stroud noted that cedars can be hollow from top to bottom, large enough that anything large could live inside. After attempting and failing to build a fire several times, a skill Stroud can execute expertly, Stroud wondered aloud, I don't know if they want us here. They, presumably being the local Sasquatch. With a wet snow falling and all available kindling soaked, the men nearly abandoned hope of a fire when suddenly, a mere fifty feet away, a tree fell, revealing a fresh supply of dry wood. Using this kindling, Stroud lit their campfire at last. The wood knock continued during this process, sounding to Stroud as if emanating from inside the tree at seemingly deliberate intervals, until the moment the fire was lit, at which point they ceased. I started out looking for what I was told was a big ape, said Stroud. Now, I'm not so sure anymore. Stroud has since experienced a number of harrowing encounters. A small but persistent set of cases also described Woodnock coming from inside of trees. The author of the bizarre Bigfoot blog detailed an experience where researcher Russell Accord and Adam Davies experienced knocking noises that seemingly emanated from a large double tree. Stopped about 20 feet from the knoll with my video camera recording, I heard two distinct thumps, whump, whump, with Davies just behind me. He said, did you hear it? And I replied twice in a soft voice, absolutely surprised. I was puzzled, but strove to remain calm as Adam climbed the small knoll happy to get results so quickly. J.B. arrived to acknowledge that he too heard strange thump. What the heck was that? I held my recorder as still as possible while Davy spoke to the tree. Hey, big guy, we're so glad to know you're here. The author notes that one member of the expedition considered the tree itself a conscious entity, something more than your average tree, while Davies was fully convinced that the creature lived inside or underneath the big double tree. One of the most controversial personalities in the Bigfoot community is Dr. Matthew Johnson. Johnson has made some truly bizarre claims, including that he helped migrate 23,542 Bigfoot souls from their dying planet to Earth. According to Johnson, these Bigfoot souls come to Earth in the form of orbs, but then become trees. Johnson claims that a Bigfoot named Zorth 
told him Bigfoot do not knock on trees, but create the sound somehow from inside the trees. According to Johnson, Dort said, we are inside the trees during the day. There is an incredibly strong folkloric precedent for strange creatures of all shapes and sizes living in trees. Setting aside all other ephemeral spirits, tree residents such as fey folk, dryad, little people, wood nymphs, and sundry winged things, here is a small sampling of Bigfoot-like critters said to make their home inside trees. The king of the forest was said to inhabit the oldest, most gnarled tree in each wood in northern Europe. Depictions of his woodland majesty always show him holding an uprooted fir tree. Bell's nickel figures from Pennsylvania German country often show the Christmas wild man holding an evergreen tree. In Scandinavia, ash trees were thought to be home for ogres or something. Actual ogres themselves cloaked in a sort of glamour to appear as trees. The Nord, a sort of demon from Norway, made its home in trees. Forest demons in Denmark hid themselves in old cherry trees. West Africa's Senegambia is home to a tree demon with long hair. A Russian proverb states that either owls or devils, a descriptor inextricably linked to Bigfoot lore, dwell in all old trees. There are stories, too, where trees themselves become animate. A wonderful example comes from the Scottish folk musician and storyteller Robin Williamson. Williamson relates the Battle of the Trees, a writing attributed to the Bard Taliesin. In the story, the magician Gwendolyn calls to life all the trees of Britain to do battle with an army from the other world. A variation on this concept appears when Shakespeare's Macbeth sees his doom in the form of an entire forest moving against him. While Burnham Wood was felled and moved by the hands of the invading force come to dethrone Macbeth, it was those old friends of Bigfoot, the witches, who prophesied Macbeth shall never vanquish be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunshire Hill shall come against him. In the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Tolkien wrote of the Ent, Ent being of the old English word for giant, a population of ancient wise but easily angered forest guardians who took the form of enormous animated tree beings. The Ent, according to Tolkien lore, were trees awakened by the magic of the elves in an earlier age. On to the next one. In Benzie County, Michigan, on a two-and-a-half-day canoe trip on the Betsy River, I pulled up to a nice sandy bank on the Betsy at dusk. When I laid the paddle against the side of the canoe, I startled approximately six whitetails, which promptly blew at me and took off. The next thing I did was set up a fishing pool supported by a small stick, then set up camp. Next, thinking the pole hit the ground, I walked over with my mini mag light and noticed that the pole had not fallen as it sounded like. I heard some leaves and sticks crack up the big bank, approximately 20 feet above my head. I shined there and saw two big eyes staring back at me. The color was a beautiful pale yellow and clear as glass. I noticed the animal move its neck slightly one way, then the next to see me better. It had to be a timber wolf. There were no others with it. We stood there looking at each other for quite some time. The wolf wouldn't budge, so I shined the light on my face, snarled at it, and kind of hollered, and off it went, Canis Lupus to the other side of the Marquette State Forest. Then I proceeded to set up camp, build a fire, and lay down, being tired and hungry, and hopefully wait for a fish to hit the spawn. About ten minutes after seeing the wolf, something big by the size of the scream, came to the edge of the bank twenty or so feet above and screamed at me twice. I grabbed the thirty-eight, cocked the hammer back, and laid the pistol on my stomach. There was one more scream after about twenty seconds and then silence and beautiful stars overhead. I didn't look for tracks the next morning because of sleeping late and wondered how many more days it would take to get me back to the next bridge. On to the next one. 
my wife and I purchased our home near Kingston, Michigan. We were having coffee in the morning on a weekend. As we were having our coffee, I was looking off into the wood behind our home and saw a tall, pitch-black ape walking from north to south. It was erect, however, slightly leaning forward, not straight up. Its arms were long and just kind of swaying loosely as it passed. It traveled about 20 feet in my view. I saw only its right side. My wife did not see it, and it is really hard for her to take me serious. I don't blame her, though. There was some snow on the ground, but very scant. No footprints. The ground was frozen. I was going to investigate, packing my 9mm, but took something with more power because this thing was huge. It was morning, full blue sky, and sunny. The area was rolling treed, thick, and open in spots, near several swamps and ponds and a few lakes. Elms, birch, white ash, poplar, cherry, scrub brushes. There are dead and living trees and lots of cover. There's also a man-made creek. It's very pretty here. In the fall, my brother was going to hunt deer in our woods and told me he was going to build a blind down by the swamp on the southwest of our 20 acres. An hour or so later, I walked back to see how he was doing, I heard what sounded like logs being thrown around, and I thought it to be strange. Like, what the heck is he building? The area is really thick with undergrowth and trees both living and dead, so to get my direction straight, I hollered his name. The sound stopped, and I hollered several times, only to hear silence. I remember feeling odd at that time. I continued forward into the swamp. I was looking down to avoid tripping on debris, and I saw, for only a second, something big move across in between two big bush-type trees in front of me. It didn't make hardly any noise, though. It was very light on its feet, not like you or I would think for something its size. So this part of my story is just odd. Not like an actual sighting, but I do believe what I saw was a Bigfoot. Also, a contractor that built a pole building for us told me in a conversation that he hunts an awful lot north of us, a few miles, where there is a big swamp. I asked him if he'd seen anything unusual while hunting, and he replied, Just, what are we talking about? I replied, You know. Have you seen anything that, let's say, shouldn't be there? He replied no, but said that his brother-in-law saw a big, hairy ape going under some underbrush while he was deer hunting. It was pitch black, and it was on all fours just like an ape would move about. Except he said it was much bigger than any ape he'd seen at the zoo. He told me how he ridiculed his brother-in-law, as did his brother-in-law's wife. Two weeks later, his wife saw the thing out a window of their house. She didn't laugh anymore. On to the next one. Apache mostly, but not limited to, Arizona, New Mexico, and some of the surrounding areas. An old story of Bigfoot Sasquatch in Arizona goes back to a story from 1903 that was also reported in the Arizona Republican newspaper. In this account, an eyewitness made an observation to an all-white-haired Bigfoot, like being that was seen drinking the blood from two cougars it had killed. This is one of the only documented cases that I've ever heard about where a Sasquatch killed and ate another known predator. Apache lore seems to also suggest that these creatures are cannibals, described as warlike and, at times, even coming out at night to feed on the desert Apache. This is also vaguely similar to the neighboring Anasazi First Nation pictograph, which depict dick men that would reach into dwellings with long arms to steal Anasazi babies at night. The Anasazi may have had no idea that the creatures, which they had depicted on stone-painted pictograph, could actually be the one and the same Bigfoot or Sasquatch. This probably again points towards the super-elusiveness of these creatures, which in some cases aren't even clearly made suspect, even though the long arms from Anasazi pictograph are also quite often noted in many of the more modern-day Bigfoot and Sasquatch observations made by eyewitnesses. 
some old Apache stories of what seems to be a similarly described Bigfoot Sasquatch are retold in Morris Edward Opler's 1942 book title Myths and Tales of the Apache Indian. One story titled The Birth of Child of the Water and the Slaying of the Monsters, in which there are depictions of a giant who is described as a bully from the beginning of human existence. The story describes the following. Long ago, there were monsters on Earth. One of them was a giant. This giant killed human beings. A footnote at the bottom of the page gives a further description as follows. A monster of great size, usually described as shaped like a man, and ordinarily carrying a knife and a basket in which to put his victims. In the beginning, the giant made it very difficult for the first people, because it stole a majority of their wild game meat, which they had hunted. As the story from the book mentioned, giant stole all the meat. Giant was also a menace to children, as the story notes, the giant came nearly every day looking for children. Giant is easily fooled quite a few times. A way of life, as the story suggests, by a mother who is trying to raise her child by always keeping the baby hidden from the giant. Her husband, described to be the first hunter, is continually killing deer, yet he's coming home without any meat because the giant steals it from him. As the child of the couple described to be the first child who grows up to become a young man gets tired of the giant who steals all the meat, he boldly exclaims, you are not going to eat the meat this time. Giant boldly exclaims back, if you don't stop that, I'll eat you right here. The young man then boldly says back to the giant, you're not going to make excrement out of our meat anymore. When the giant asks the young man how he'll fight him, the boy pulls out an arrow, which he then displays to the giant. Object showing is a bluff. When the giant is then asked by the young man, where are your weapons, the story says, the giant pointed to four great pine logs and said, there are my weapons. The two then agree to have a shooting contest, allowing four shots each, in which the giant hurls a log each time. As the story notes, it looked as if the giant was helped by thunder, for every time the arrow flew, thunder was heard. Could this be yet another observation to the weather-changing ability of Bigfoot or Sasquatch, this time on behalf of the Apache? Luckily, the young man wasn't hit by a single log, and then it was his turn to shoot four arrows at the giant. Yet, as the story mentions, the giant stood ready. He had four plates of rock for coat over him. The giant is once again fooled by the young man, who then requests that the giant stand on his hands and knees. This gives the young man a better vantage point for an angle that he can use to shoot off the giant's rock coat or stone coat. The young man shoots off a layer of the giant's rock coat with each shot until eventually there is only one rock coat left, and the young man has only one shot remaining. The story then notes the young man's success in finishing off the giant. The fourth shot went right into his heart. Then the giant began to fall. He went over four small hills when he was falling, and you can see the piles of white flint there today. It seems fascinating that the Apache, Navajo, Zuni, Pueblo, and Anasazi all have stories with suggestions of how their tribal members may have been bullied, hunted, killed, and even eaten by what seems to be similarly described as Bigfoot and Sasquatch. One might also find it interesting that these separate tribes all existed in some of the same areas and at separate intervals in some cases. As was the case of the Fremont, followed by the Anasazi, who had also disappeared before some of the above-mentioned tribes came about in much of the same area. This adds even more credibility to these stories. Pictographs and legends of these various tribes of the desert, southwestern Native American tribes, were also feeding vast surplus populations, like the Anasazi and the Pueblo, who also lived in cities of stone houses. 
and probably weren't leaving enough resources to feed on for a giant like Sasquatch, especially in desert surroundings where resources might already be scarce, like that of Arizona and New Mexico. It should also be known that the Apache moved seasonally with the antelope, elk, deer, and buffalo, which they would also hunt. Bigfoot in Native American stories, as well as more modern-day observation, also hunt these prey animals for food. What might occur if Bigfoot or Sasquatch couldn't acquire enough meat due to hunters who may have been doing a lot of surplus killing? Might it be a similar pattern to chimps eating monkeys over food sources, which might already be scarce? In another story called Stories of the Giant, two women play dead and escape the giant. The giant used to kill people. There were two women hunting for wild berries. The giant came along. They saw that they couldn't get away, but they knew that he wouldn't eat anything dead that he had not killed himself. So they took off their clothes and played dead. Giant came along and saw them. He took a stick and poked at them. He played for a while, then got tired and left them. When he was gone, they got up and ran away. It's quite interesting how the giant had been poking at the women with a stick while they were playing dead. This seems to be a similar shared characteristic to some of the curious nature of other primates, most notably the gorilla which sometimes uses a stick to touch another object. In another story, the conquest for daylight makes the observation of birds, which are, as we all know, only out during the daytime. In the story, they are playing a game against all of the other animals for daylight hours instead of an endless nighttime, as the animals would have it. The story also notes, in those days, there was a great monster, a giant, giant on the animal side, it's interesting how in this Apache story, the giant is somehow closely associated with all of the other animals, where in European folklore, giants are usually depicted as more closely associated with humans. As the game is being played all throughout the night until daybreak, a wren then sings, Daybreak is coming. This greatly upsets the giant, as the story then notes. This made the giant so angry that he took a stick from the fire and pushed it right into the wren. Keep still, there isn't going to be any daylight, he said as he jabbed the bird. That is why wren has a black mark on his head now. This seems to be a rather strong suggestion of the giant being described as both nocturnal and aggressive. As the sun continues to rise, almost all of the other nocturnal animals leave, and the giant begins to leave as he exclaims, I'm too heavy, I can't walk very fast, I'm going to leave now. The birds then begin to pursue the other animals which had lost the game that was played, including the giant. They attack the giant a number of times with little or no effect at all. Then a lizard tells the bird where the giant's heart is, as he ran to the giant. There, there's his heart right under his hind foot, he said. This little lizard shot the giant right under his hind foot, and the monster fell. Could this be another indication to a soft spot being described on this creature's body? The story then mentions, this place where they played is in Arizona. They call it Mescal Mountain. It is a holy mountain. The footnote at the bottom of the page reads, the information identified this as the Mogollon Mountain. According to David Hatcher Childress in his book, Yetis, Sasquatch, and Hairy Giant, a current non-tribal name given to Sasquatch and Bigfoot in the same Mogollon Mountains region of Arizona is the Mogollon Monster. According to Childress, the Apache have also had a number of eyewitness sightings from some of their reservation areas in more recent times. Apache National Police also have a number of recent sightings reported on record. For the most part, it seems that the Apache like to keep Bigfoot and Sasquatch a secret within their tribal community. This is probably the reason that it seems so difficult in finding some of their stories on the subject matter. The Apache description of strange beings they call Gahi, these are described to be very secretive unknown people which actually live in the mountain. 
It is also a forbidden superstition among the Apache to even speak the name of the Gahi, much like the fears associated with what is referred to as the Lesky or Wood Goblin by those who live throughout the borderlands among the mountains in Russia. Another informant averred that it is dangerous to even tell stories of the Gahi and to decrease the hazard, ceremonial names such as mountain people are introduced into the tales in which they appear. In one story titled, The Gahi Who Fought the Mexican Soldiers, tells a dramatic revelation of some warm springs Apache who had been walking peacefully through the plains to the foot of Chuchillo Mountain. The foot of many mountains seems to be a common theme in many of these Native American stories of strange mountain deities. The story then notes, as quoted, that the Mexican cavalry came after them. The Apache were carrying no weapons at all, as they were trying to make an escape, yet, as the story mentions, the soldiers had guns and could kill from a distance. One man who was away from the others, running toward the mountain, prayed for help from the Gahi. The Gahi came out from the mountain, many of them. They surrounded the soldiers. They opened a cave in the rocks, and with their swords, drove the soldiers into the cave. Then they shut the door again, and not one of the soldiers ever got out. They say there are shoes piled up at the mouth of the cave, yet to show where the soldiers were driven in. A detail in a footnote at the bottom of the page reads the following, that the Gahi are notified of the plight of the Apache by wind, who acts as the messenger for them. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!